is the glory of the Lord. Though the Lord is on high, yet he regards the lowly, but the proud he knows from afar. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you will revive me. You will stretch out your hand against the wrath of my enemies, and your right hand will save me. The Lord will perfect that which concerns me. Your mercy, I will endure forever. Do not forsake the works of your hands. Psalm 138. Psalm for the faithful. Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for this new day. We thank you that it's the Lord's day. It's your day. Father, I praise you and thank you that we can lay everything aside, every thought, every concern, everything, because it's all about you, Father. It's all about you, Jesus. Build your church. Move among your church. And as we lift our voices in praise and in worship to you, as we gather around your word, Father God, just be magnified, be lifted up, be glorified, be worshipped, be adored, because you are more and more and more and more than that. More than worthy of our praises. So we give everything into your hands, every single part. We make it glory, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <laughs>
trusted in your word, trusted in your cross, trusted in your love, and all your faithfulness, for your power.
Make sure that we know if it's for the work we intend with or if you would like to give to our missionaries or missionary aviation. If you'd like to give here to our missionary aviation, we have this little box. It 
takes points and notes. <laughs> and for the offering um, that we take up to pay our bills, to keep the doors open, I will leave a basket right over there. Just make also sure if it's for missionaries, um, for the temples, that will go to or are already in the French. Are they already there? Not yet. Not yet. They're on the way to um, the French Guerrilla and supportive management also in frames. Amen. Yeah, so I will leave everything over there and we will pray. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, our sovereign God, blessed be your name. All powerful, almighty, you know everything, you know the hearts from us. You're an amazing God and you adopted us into your family. Blessed assurance. Jesus is mine. Thank you for salvation. Thank you. You chose us. You placed us. You placed us here in Tenerife. It's an honor. It's an honor to be here. We thank you so much for every day this church is open. We thank you for every day that the doors stay open. That your will be done and not ours. And today is your day. It's not the Lord's hour, not two hours, it's the Lord's day. Thank you that you gave us this Sunday. Thank you that we can come together and praise you, give you glory. We thank you now for everyone that's giving. Oh, Father, thank you so much. And I pray that you give us wisdom how to distribute the money for your kingdom. To you be all that glory, power, and grace. In Christ's name, in your son's name, we pray. Father, we thank you for your, for your word. We thank you for the truth that's in your word. We thank you for the wisdom that's in your word. We thank you for the guidance we receive through your word. We thank you for those that have brought this word to us over the centuries, that today we can still hold this in our hands and know that it's the true, the authoritative, the only truth in this world that we can rely upon. The word of God, your word. The word of our Father. And Father, I pray that as we hear this word and I proclaim this word this morning, that we digest it, that we take it into our hearts, that we understand it, that we don't just be listeners, but we be doers. That we understand the truth of the word of the gospel of Jesus Christ is not just to sit and passively listen, but it's to take part to be part of the church, your bride, to take action, to stand up for what is true, what is right, and not just to roll over. Father, I pray that this word this morning speaks to us in such a way that it would motivate us to change, to bring you the glory, to bring you the honor, to bring you the praise, that we may give our lives to you, for you, and only for you, in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. We're going through the book of Galatians, but I'd first like us to turn, if you've got your Bibles with you, if you need a Bible, put your hand up and you'll put one in your hand. Um, but I'd first like us to turn to Hebrews. Um, Chapter 4, verse 12. For the word of God is living and powerful 
and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the division of soul and spirit and the joints and marrow, and it is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The word of God is a living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. When we gather around the word of God, we should come out cut to the quick. We should come out not saying how wonderful and beautiful we are, but actually how wretched and how much we need a saviour. The word of God is living, it's alive, but we need to let that word of God come alive inside us. We need to look into the word of God. We don't just need to be sitters and hearers and listen to what read of anything in, in the Word, especially of the Apostles, we can see that they worked hard. They worked hard. They didn't stop. They didn't give up because it was raining, because it was cold, or because they had a late night, or anything. They were faithful. They kept on it. They went through pain. They went through stonings, through lashings, through imprisonment, through shipwrecks. Did they give up? Did they say, well, I'll give it a miss today. No. And this is the word of God. We need to be more like the word of God if we claim to be Christians. Diamonds, a man's best friend, you have a girl's best friend apparently. But you don't find diamonds on the surface, do you? You don't walk into a diamond field and pick up hordes of diamonds. Otherwise, they'd be worthless. What do we do to get diamonds? We dig, and we dig, and we dig. And we pay a lot of money. Because they're worth digging for. And the Word of God is the same. You've got to dig. You've got to dig into it. If you don't dig into it, then it's dead for us. It's worthless to you. So we're going through the Galatians at the moment, and I know there's a there's the history and everything else attached to it, but there's teaching, there's wisdom, there's, there's knowledge, there's life application in every word of God, because it's written by who? The Holy Spirit. It's written by the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit wants the best for you. He wants to lead you and guide you. So if we turn now back to Galatians, we're in, uh, still in chapter 1, but today we're going to hopefully finish chapter 1. And we're in verse 18, and we're going through to verse 24. So Galatians chapter 1, verse 18 to 24 says, Then after three years I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter, and remained with him fifteen days. But I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. Now concerning the things which I write to you, indeed, before God, I do not write. Afterward I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and I was unknown by face to the churches of Judea, which were in Christ. But they were herein only. He who formerly persecuted us now preaches the faith which he once tried to destroy. And they glorified God in me. The Apostle Paul opened this letter, if you remember, when we, we, we went back to the beginning of this a few weeks ago, saying that the gospel he preached was not devised by human wisdom, that he had not received it from, the, from other apostles, but rather he was taught it directly by Jesus Christ himself. And he continues by reminding them that he had been trained and was a fanatic, was fanatically devoted to the flawed traditions of Judaism. He was the Jew of Jews. He was the persecutor. He was the prosecutor. He was the district attorney. But when he met with the risen Christ on the Damascus Road, he was commissioned to preach the gospel. And what's more, the fantastic thing about this, if we haven't already seen this, was that he was told to preach to the Gentiles, the very ones the Jews disliked, the very ones they didn't want to be associated with. 
And Paul, the Jew of Jews, was now being sent to who? The Gentiles. Did he turn around and say, oh, no, 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 he didn't. He went straight away. Obedient, we know that because we read it last week. He was preaching to the Jews and then he went to the Gentiles. So in verse 18 it says, after three years I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and remained with him for 15 days. But I saw none of the other apostles except James and Lord's brother. And Paul makes a clear point here, that when Christ called him, he did not go to Jerusalem. He didn't go to Jerusalem where he could have received teaching or instruction from the apostles straight away, but after three years, and we touched on that last week, we spoke about it, didn't we? the reception he might have got if he'd returned to Jerusalem. So Paul had been sent by the, the Jews to go and get these Christians, and now he was going, going to go back empty-handed, and now converted to the faith that he was trying to put down. And the Christians, they wouldn't have had nothing to do with him. So he, had, he couldn't go back to Jerusalem. He had no choice. But the Holy Spirit kept him away. So we know, we read that he, he retired to an area in Arabia, which is now known as Arabia for a time, and not until three years later did he go to Jerusalem. Three years. I mean, I think sometimes we, we get, we, we, we read the word, and we think everything follows chronologically. Everything follows like, that happened today, that happened tomorrow, that happened the next week, that happened the next day, that happened the next month. But it's not like that. We need to read the word and see what's in the word and see that time. Three years is a long time, eh? A long time. So everyone seems to regard that Paul went this and done that and done this right away, but it's not the case. It's not the truth. It's not the facts. And he's writing that here. He went to Arabia and uh, he spent three years as he and Christ being taught by Jesus himself. You can read that in chapter 1, verse 12. That was either directly or perhaps in what most people would say would be the terminology that he was studying the word. He was really studying the word. The word that he knew so well, proclaiming the coming of the Messiah, he was now restudying it in the light of the revelation of Jesus Christ, as we have today. We have the revelation of Jesus Christ. We can study it in that way. And therefore, like the other apostles, Paul studied with Jesus for three years. The other apostles studied with Jesus for three years. Yeah, they walked with him, talked with him, talked with him, spoke 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 with him. He says here as well, the only other apostle, the, the apostle he met was Peter. And the only other leader, or he met there, was, was James, who was at the moment, at that time, the presiding elder of the church in Jerusalem. And it's interesting as well here that Paul confirms that James is the one human half-brother of Jesus. Remember that Christ's brothers did not follow him, they didn't believe him initially. We read that in, we can read that in the Gospel of John, verse, uh, chapter 7, verse 5. But later, with Mary, their mother, they come to believe, and we can read that in Acts 1, 14. So they didn't become his followers until after his resurrection. So consider Paul, after three years in Arabia, where he's completely been broken, everything that he once built his life upon, everything that was he, he was so zealous about. I mean, you've got to consider this guy. He, he was the Jew of the Jews. There was no PlayStations, there were no telephones, there was nothing in them days. It was solely word of God. And that's what he was brought up on from a kid. And now he was able to undo all that and look at it. And by the grace of God, he could work it out. And then he says he came to Peter and was with him for 15 days. Can you imagine what happened in that 15 days? Just 15 days, two weeks. Peter, I guess, would have gone through the whole story, wouldn't he? About Jesus. The whole story beginning when he was on the lake, when he got called. Paul had sat there listening to this first hand eyewitness, first hand person, I walked with Jesus. He called me, he was on the shore and he called me. He would have gone through the story of in the Garden of Gethsemane, he would have gone and told him everything, what happened on the cross and what happened afterwards. And Peter 
it was probably taken into a communion service or some sort of service where, guess what? He would have met the widows and the mothers of the bereaved that he had persecuted and put to death. He would have looked them in the face. He would have probably shaken their hands. He maybe even kissed them. And maybe even kissed him. Think about what a memory that must have been like. It takes great courage. And it's the right thing to do. For a forgiven man to come into contact face to face with those who he has wronged. To stand in front of them and say, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. So Paul, we're about to go through all that. I think we can agree that his first three years was a lot of stuff going on in his life. And he refers to Peter and he refers to James. Was it because he was fearful of them or were they fearful of him? Some commentators would say that the reason would have been they may not have been in Jerusalem at the time. They could have been out, you know, they been doing their, their missionary work. But when we read through Acts, which is a, a wonderful book to have open, I think, sometimes when we're reading this, it's most likely Paul would have not been able to see even Peter or James without the assistance of a man called Barnabas. Um, if you turn to the book of Acts, chapter 9, verses 26 to 29, and Luke writes uh, this account. He says, And when Saul had come to Jerusalem, it says here, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him and did not believe that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. And he declared to them how he had seen the Lord on the road and that he had spoken to him and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. So he was with them at Jerusalem, coming in and going out. And he spoke boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus and disputed against the Hellenists, but they attempted to kill him. In verse 20 of, uh, of this book we're reading in Galatians, Paul says, Now concerning the things which are right to you, indeed before God, I do not lie. Paul is now committing an oath in writing. It's one thing to make an oath in, in vocally, verbally, which you can break in five minutes. No one ever said that. But he actually writes it down. He writes down, concerning the things which I write to you, indeed, before God, I do not write. He would have been more than aware that breaking an oath would have incurred divine judgment. And this deterred most people from swearing falsely in them days. And Paul is writing down, this is true. He takes a solemn oath. And this was probably in order to answer specific charges of misrepresentation that were being made against him. And the fact that as we go through this letter, we can see that Paul was answering specific charges. And that comes evident in these first two chapters. We've already seen how he made sure that they knew he was an apostle. Each historical event he mentions relates to a specific argument. And it's important to remember that Paul is not trying to provide chronological outline. He's just writing a letter to the Galatians because, as we know, he's angry. They've already, within a few months, started listening to another gospel, which is no gospel at all. So he's putting across his point here. In verse 21, he said, Afterwards I went into the region of Syria and Cilicia, and I was unknown by face to the churches of Judea, which were in Christ, but they were hearing only he who formerly persecuted us now preaches the faith which he once tried to destroy. And they glorified God in me. So Paul, after his visit to Jerusalem and meeting with Barnabas, meeting with Peter, meeting with James, went back into the region of Syria and Cilicia. We know that Paul was from that area. Paul was Saul of Tarsus. It was that area that he came from. And also we can read from that account, as we just read in Acts, that those in Jerusalem were trying to kill him. And if you read a bit more in Acts, you'll find out where they helped him escape from Jerusalem because they were trying to kill him. 
the, the Jewish people wanted to get rid of him, get rid of this guy that was once such a great influence for us and is now preaching Christ. Let's, let's get rid of him. So he went back into his uh, home territory. And as I said, I think it's worth sometimes if you're going through Galatians, if you've got two Bibles, open the book of Acts because a lot of stuff happens in there and happens in there and if you put it all together and go, oh yeah, I see where this is happening now. This area would have included his hometown and he was preaching in that region for several years. And when the word of revival in that area reached Jerusalem, who did they send to find out? Barnabas. And you can read that again in Acts 11, 26. So Barnabas obviously had some kind of trust and faith in Paul that what he was saying was true because he took him to the apostles. And then you can imagine the conversation can't be in Jerusalem where there's apparently a revival going on in, in, uh, in, in that area. But who are we going to send? Maybe it's a trap. Well, let's send Barnabas. Barnabas trusts Paul and Paul trusts Barnabas. So Barnabas, off he goes. Don't hear much about Barnabas. But it was Barnabas who went. And he was obviously confident that Paul's testimony and what they were hearing was true. Otherwise, he'd come, in, he'd come into his death. And Paul stayed on in that region and then passed through the churches in the area of Antioch. And with Barnabas, they went from there on their first missionary journey. Again, we can read that in Acts 13. And afterwards, they returned to Antioch. We can read that in Acts 14. And from when they were sent to Jerusalem, to the Jerusalem Council, we can read that in Acts 14 as well, Acts 14 and 15. So the strict sequence of events isn't really our main concern. It's just really putting out the what happened in my life after I become converted. What happened? What did I do? Where did I go? And he's trying to get this point across. Really interesting the stuff that's, that's, that's written for us that so often we just don't see it. The diamonds. We've got to dig for them. We've got to dig for the diamonds. He says that he was unknown by face of the churches. So he was not recognisable as a person. There was no Facebook in them days, there was no Instagram, Snapchat, TikTok, television. They didn't know who he was. Just another guy. But his reputation, his reputation now preceded him. They were more than aware of his past. And he makes reference to the fact that these churches in Christ. And now they were witnessing for themselves that what they heard was true. He was preaching the good news. He was preaching Christ crucified. He was preaching at the resurrection. His reputation preceded him. His reputation. Wow. Who's got a reputation? Anyone? Past? Before you come to Christ? I'm not proud of my reputation before I come to Christ. And when I did come to Christ, many people didn't believe me. And they knew me by face. Yet when I sat there and said, I'm a Christian. I got laughed at. Ridiculed. You can't be a Christian. You haven't read the Bible. That's what the first thing they said. You can't be a Christian. You left here on Friday, you come back Monday, and how can you become a Christian in two days? Well, it happened. And it happened to us. But this was new, wasn't it? This was new. It hadn't happened before this way. This was this was all new. The Bible wasn't written yet, they were still writing it. So it must have been confusing. Paul was preaching Christ, the good news of Christ, Christ crucified, Christ is resurrection. And we overlook that miracle today. We hear maybe of a soul coming and saving faith. Maybe we smile, maybe we say, wow, glory to God. Or something. But without fully understanding the miracle that's taking place, yet if someone comes up to you and says, oh, I had a bad arm and they prayed for me and my bad arm's better now. Wow! Wow! Because we want to see. We want to experience. We 
don't understand what could be what could be more of a miracle than a soul passing from death to life. When we hear that, we should go crazy. We should go praise God, glory to God, hallelujah. Rather than, oh, this is good, it's nice. But we want to see some physical manifestation. We want to see something earthly. We want to see evidence. Evidence. I can't see it. I don't believe it. But we see the evidence in a safe soul and we see the fruit. And it doesn't pop out straight away. I'm growing tomatoes at the moment. They don't pop out. The day I plant them, they don't pop out. They take time to pop out. They take time to mature. They take time to grow. And we are the same. Paul is obviously attesting to that when he says he spent three years. He took time to grow. A soul saved, truly saved, is saved forever. I was thinking on that, and I was thinking of the miracle that Jesus performed with, with Lazarus. What a, what a, a miracle. Jack, Lazarus was dead. He was wrapped up in the living. I think it was one of the was it a King James? But actually, he says that he's stinking. But Jesus brought Lazarus back, and the whole place glorified him. And some was like, "Well, I'm not sure about all that one." Some were saying he was asleep or whatever. But that was a miracle. The problem is, think about Lazarus. He still had to die again. So he died twice. Because Lazarus is not alive today, is he? In the earthly form. So, the miracle was, for a purpose, a temporary. A soul saved is for eternity. That's something worth crazy about that. Really. So where do we come to with this? How do we apply all this into our lives? Well, Paul had a life-changing experience. Paul demonstrates complete, total repentance, 180 degrees. He turned around from his past. He met the people he had hurt. Those that he had caused much pain to, he met them and I guess he would have apologised and asked their forgiveness. Paul couldn't keep it quiet. He couldn't suppress it. He, and he even wrote down an oath in writing, which was really important at that time. Everything had changed. Everything changed. Everything. Everything changed for Paul. Has everything changed for us? Ask yourself that question. Paul was once a steadfast member and respected member of the biggest Jewish council. But he was now being hunted down to by them to the point of death. Did that keep him quiet? He went preaching, he went teaching, he travelled. He probably travelled with one or two people. He was in danger of death constantly. He kept him silent. And I think if we're hearing this message today, the truth that's in this message, do you see yourself in this somewhere? Has your meeting with the risen Saviour changed your life around or just become an inconvenience or just just an animal. Church. Are you keeping your faith to yourself just so you don't upset anyone? Oh, I don't want to upset anyone, so I'm not going to say anything. I want to sound like a Christian. Or maybe you don't understand your faith enough to tell us. Maybe you just don't understand. Maybe because you just never took the time. And you can't witness because you don't know what you're witnessing about. Mm -hmm. Say to a Christian, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian. Yeah. Why? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I put my hand up at the church service like four years ago. And they said, well, I'm going to tell me I was born again. Really? So much of this today. But those around you notice the change in you, like they did with Paul. Paul was like the bad guy for the Christians, good guy for the Jews, but he changed. 
people noticed the change. His reputation went before him. So those around you noticed the change, not just the, the change for a few weeks, a few months, but have they seen in your hardest, darkest, worst of times that you turn to Christ? Do you witness for Christ? Do you tell them you're a Christian or do you hide it? Are you ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ? Are you scared that your friends might find out if you go to church on Sunday? Is your priority prayer? Is your priority the word of God? Is your priority that you can sit down in front of the TV and, and watch a series when it starts, or you can get to a football match when it starts, but you can drift in the church probably 10, 15 minutes late, or if not at all, I'll just leave it this week, I'll go next week. Because that's what it's about, guys. It's not easy. Jesus never said it was going to be easy. And as many people need to run about. One person running backwards. Around in circles. It can be lonely. You can feel super isolated to walk with Jesus. You can be ridiculed, you can be rejected, you can be held at arm's length by people that you once loved and they don't love you. And all of a sudden they go, well, keep away. But Jesus walks with you. He's walking with you. And he sees you. He sees everything you do. And when you ignore him, when you are ashamed of him, He looks at you on that cross and said, I did this for you. And we can't even be bothered sometimes, so I can never have to spend a few minutes in prayer. Shame on us. All of us. Shame on us. I sense that today, and I've seen it, read about it, and it's happening. The woke culture is now coming into the churches. Adjustments are being made in, in so many churches now, in big churches. We're talking about the Church of England, the Church of this, the Church, you know, the, the established, that's called the established churches, where they're starting to accept the man's view. The man's view, yeah, he's got a point, you know, we're getting intelligent and we're working this out and yeah, they're right. And they're going to take man's view rather than God's view. They're going to look at life through our lens and not through God's lens. We're going to start making adjustments because people get offended when they come into church and, and we sing holy songs. So let's just change it a little bit so people feel welcome. It's God's church, Jesus' church, His bride, His church. And the drift away from the authority of scripture in order to comply with today's culture just to be accepted well. That's a challenge for all of us. It's a challenge for me, it's a challenge for us. Are you going to stand in the authority of scripture? But if you say you are, then you need to know the authority of scripture. <laughs> you need to know the scripture or you can't stand on it. And if you know scripture, then you'll be fine because you can stand on it and be true to it and be confident and secure in it. But if you're not confident and secure, it's because you're not standing in the scripture. You've built your house on the sand and not on the rock. There are no Sunday only Christians, you know. It's the same as there are no nine to five, five day a week business owners, are there many? You don't go nine to five and your phone switches off at five o'clock on a Friday night and then you go back and switch on at nine o'clock on a Monday. It doesn't happen, does it? It's 24-7. And we're 24 7 Christians, we're not Christian at all. It's your life. And we're to live our faith out before others, as Paul says. What he instructs us to do. Let's just turn quickly to Hebrews 10 25. This is a text that often gets overlooked these days, especially since we now have uh, internet. He 
in view of today with the churches and the way that the, a lot of churches are doing things, I said the other day that many churches are now just doing online services. So does that mean we can cross this out then? This, this verse we can take out of the Bible, we have to not need it anymore. It's irrelevant now. Old fashioned. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. It's a command. Not forsaking. Don't. As is the manner of some. But exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Wow. Do we all agree the day is approaching? So, where are the churches filled with Christians? Where? Where are the prayer meetings? Where are the Bible studies? Where are the men's groups? Where are the women's groups? Where? Where? Personal contact with other Christians is not a suggestion. It's not in the Bible as a good idea. It is commanded. Relationships with other believers are one way to encourage others to live out their faith. To encourage new believers. For the, for the old and mature believers to, to get behind them, to give them support. When they're going through dark times, they, 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 what are they going to do? Young Christians, however old they may be in years, what do they do? Where do they turn to? Facebook? Stupid YouTube, oh, everything's going to be wonderful. Preachers that don't worry about this. They need people that have been in the trenches. They need people that have been there. To get alongside them and come on, I know it's tough. And it's going to get tougher, guess what? Yeah, you might lose your life, yeah. But, do you believe in Christ? Yeah, well come on then. Let's keep going. We've lost that relationship. There's a guy I watch quite, come quite often on, on uh, YouTube called uh, Vody Falcon, I think his name is. He's got a great voice, he's a big, big voice. Black American guy. Right? And he said that the other week, I was watching a thing, and he said, if you, don't, if, if you progress to love Jesus, but you don't love the church, you're a liar. Because the church is Jesus. It's his bride. So does the husband love the bride? Yeah? yeah? So if we're Christians, Christ in us, followers of Christ, then we are to love the church. If you don't love the church, then you can't love Christ. And it was like a bold statement, but so true. The word of God is going to cut you. The word of God is going to cut you to the quick. The word of God is going to open up some wounds and say, you need to sort this out. Fix it. There's poison. Get it out. The great commission of the church was to make disciples, not to make converts. Not to merely have a chat about football or TV shows or anything to make disciples. Talk about your faith to one another. Building one another up in the faith. This is so clear. It's a Christian's obligation to have fellowship with other Christians. Simple. Don't neglect the gathering of the saints. We can meet each other's needs. We can inspire them. And we can read that in Hebrews, the prayer, we can read that in Colossians. Yeah, today, Church is just an add on. It's an extra. If I can make it. Oh, I'm a bit busy on Sunday morning, so. Oh, you know what? I'll tune in later and watch it online. Wow. What ever happened in the New Testament times that Paul said that? James. Titus. John. Matthew. Mark. Luke. We've got to get something back into us. The church is the bride of Christ. He died for it. He loves it. Let that sink in. Let that sink in. You can't just go to church and pretend you're interested. I have it. Mum and dad go, so I've got to go. You've got to go out and desire. You've got to want to go. You've got to want to hear the word of God. You've got to want to be around other Christians. You've got to want that. And if you haven't got that want inside you, then truly, guys, we went through it a couple of weeks ago, your genuine faith, truly, seek your heart. 
Are you really psyched? Are you really part of the class? Or are you just bouncing around on the outskirts? Because when you follow Christ, you can't not go to church on Sunday because you want to go to church on Sunday. Mondays roll around and then the whole cycle comes again, doesn't it? The whole world starts bashing in again. We need to keep this fellowship. We need to keep fellowship with one another. And living out our faith is only possible because of what Christ has done for us on the cross. When he died, he made a way for us to no longer live for ourselves, but to live for something greater, someone greater. The lives we live after accepting Jesus Christ is one of faith, one of surrender, one of obedience. Remember the other week, Julos? Bond servants, bond with the Christ, the precious price of Christ, our Saviour. That's what he paid. Surely he's worth time. Time in prayer. Time to help others. Time to build up others. If you're an old Christian, time to get alongside younger Christians and support them, help them, guide them. I'm going to finish with this verse in Matthew 5, 16. Jesus' words. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. have the light in you, then let it shine. Let others see it. Let others see what God has done in your life. Give glory to your Father in heaven. Because of a godly testimony, a convincing testimony of the saving power of God, you can speak all you want. You can blah, 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 all your life. What happened with Paul? His reputation with the Paul. Proof that he was a Christian. Proof that he had changed. Proof that he had 180 degrees repented from his past. Proof, 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 proof. Just in that one chapter that we've read, he's proved what he was to what he is now. And that the others who were once afraid of him were now testifying because of his reputation. That is our reputation. That should be your reputation. Not by going to charities and doing wonderful things, however charitable that may be, but proof of the fruit and the light that people can see and go, wow, that person's changed. Or that person is so different than anyone else. Whenever I go to them, they're always kind, they're always helpful, they're always willing to do something. That's glorified your Father in heaven. That is living out your faith. It's not pretending, it's not putting it on, it's not a cloak that you take off when you get home, or when you're around Christian people. That is living out your faith. When the rubber hits the road, is that where you really are? And that is what brings God the glory. And that's what we're made for. If you're a Christian, you're not made for yourself. You're not made to have a good time. You're not made to enjoy life. You're not made to do this, go there. He made to follow Christ and bring him the glory. My life is not my own. To you, I belong. Do you not sing that? Do you believe it? Because if you believe it, then we should take it out. Amen. Mm -hmm. Father, I just want to thank you for the truth that's in your words. Father God, yes, yes, and yes. Sometimes it hurts. Sometimes it cuts me. And I thank you. I thank you that you get the truth out. I thank you that the Holy Spirit digs the truth out of us. And it's going to be painful. Sometimes it's like a, a poisonous wolf or something that's grown in us that has to be cut and lanced and washed clean. But you do this for our best. 
You do this because you love us. You left us your word because you love us. And your word is a challenge. And I thank you. I thank you that we're not walking around dying spiritually because we have no leadership or no guidance. I thank you that you give us the remedy, you give us the cure through your Son, Jesus Christ. Through your word, by your Spirit. And I pray that, yeah, this work is, this word today has been tough, it? and I'm sure offensive to some. But it's your word. It's your word. And I praise you for that. I thank you for that. And I pray that we may learn and make changes where required. To bring you the glory. To bring you the honor. To bring you the praise. For I was made for this. I was made to worship you. Praise the name of Jesus. Amen. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. Uh, next week we have a guest speaker. Um, most of you know him, Bill, from uh, Turi Family Church will be here to bring the word next Sunday. Um, you all welcome to be here to the next Sunday. Amen. Stand and receive this blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine down upon you and give.